Alléluia. Amen, amen. Blessed Seigneur Bishop. Yes, welcome back, Overseer, Senior Overseer. Amen, thank you. Yes. You have a question or, or expectation for our meeting today? A question? No, no, I don't have a question. Any expectation? Expectation is to learn, yes. Wonderful. Have an to expectation learn. to learn. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you so much for that wonderful expectation. It's a powerful one. Mm, anybody else with a with an expectation? Don't be afraid. Just say it. So we had spent some time discussing communication. We spent some time discussing conflict resolution. And we have all those teachings on YouTube. Um, we had gone really in depth discussing the steps of conflict resolution um, in communication. Um, so if there is no expectation from your side, somebody has written a message here. Aha. Uh -huh. um, Shange Lao has written there, I want to discuss family planning, all right? Mm -hmm. not, not a problem. Okay, that's a good one. Very good, good one there. Very good topic there. Very important topic. Anybody else? Yeah, you may write in the text, in the chat box, if you think your English is not advanced. Like, <clears throat> like some, like some people. If you're afraid of your English, you may also write in the chat box. Not that everybody that writes in the chat box is afraid of English. It's just my sense of humor. Okay. Good. Okay, if uh, if conflict, if um, what Shangela has written is, is all, then not a problem, 2021. Mm -hmm. All right. And then after we share expectation, then the next one is what has uh, what has the Lord been teaching you recently? That's the next. I had, I had one, one, one question. Hmm? What has the Lord been teaching you recently? Anybody who would like to share? Hallelujah. Anybody who would like to share what the Lord has been teaching them recently? Amen. Amen. Blessed Senior Bishop. Amen. Yes, please. You are, you, the floor is yours. Yes, sir. Yes. How effective communication. Please say yes, that again. Please. Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Yes, for me, I have learned a lot uh, during our recent. Uh, Meetings yes. regards marriage. Mm -hmm. I have learned um, conflict resolution, how mm -hmm. conflict uh, will always be available or may arise, and then uh, mm -hmm. the solution is what's, uh, what is more important. How can you come to the mutual understanding? Mm -hmm. I have learned so much that uh, conflict is very healthy for every relationship. Mm -hmm. Because it comes with learning and uh, comes with uh, maturity also. Mm -hmm. You get to mature when you encounter conflict and then you get to resolve it. Mm -hmm. The only conflict that is not effective is when uh, 
you did not arrive to the mutual understanding. Mm -hmm. But uh, conflict is unavoidable where there are two or three, even if it's in. Yes. Yes, I learn more on conflict resolution, uh, communication, how we learn how to communicate effectively with our spouses, yes. how we should uh, be polite and know how to answer one another mm -hmm. in good and bad times. <laughs> how there will be no relationship that he does not have communication. It's compared with life without a spirit. You will never know what the other person is expecting of you if you don't communicate. Yes. And no one is a mind reader. It. Yes, please. Oh, yes. And uh, do it effective. Do it in a way when you all have time to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And yes, communication is very key. And that's also one of the second aspect that I learned, communication and conflict resolution. Definitely. It's, yes, the, yes. it's the under underlying thread of any relationship. No? Yes, please. That holds everything together. Yes. <clears throat> communication. communication. Holds everything together like this. If, if there's a breakdown in communication, then everything else will break down. <laughs> Yes. So if, if it was the if if the relationship was a body, then communication is the is the connective tissue. Amen. <laughs> amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's well. Amen. <clears throat> uh huh. Yes, very powerful senior of us. Yeah, and you know the topic of communication. There is so much to mind there. <clears throat> so much to mind, so much to go back. In fact, we shall, we shall go back soon, one of these days, to communication. Amen. Very, very important. Let's revisit that. Yes. Very, very, very important. All right. <clears throat> um, Senior uh, Pastor Whitney asked there, I want to discuss, he wants us to discuss how to guard one another <clears throat> from, going the down, from going down the wrong path. Biblical correction, answering well and asking well. These are very powerful questions there. Thank you so much. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Great. Um, <clears throat> so today's topic once more, it's um, a marriage covenant. What is a marriage covenant? Okay. <clears throat> um, anybody, who, anybody else who would like to share? Uh, what the Lord has been teaching you recently? Senior Overseer Makai, you're always, you're always loaded with new lessons. <laughs> so, please, please repeat that again. I say you're always loaded with, with, with new lessons. Would you mind to share with us what the Lord has been teaching you recently? Would you like to teach us what the Lord has been teaching you recently? <clears throat> okay, I hope uh, you are getting me. I can also share what the Lord has been teaching me of late. Um, for of late, I've been learning to, <clears throat> to make time, to make time for, for, for my wife, for my children, the deliberate to, to be deliberate. Amen. I've been learning to be deliberate to make time. Uh, I'm sure you can all just <coughs> uh, agree with me that um, it's so easy to get carried away, um, especially some of us that can get quite busy. Uh, you find yourself, you have to do this, and then you have to do that, and then this person needs your help, and then this person needs your help. Biscuits and chips. <laughs> and it's so easy to get caught up in the busyness of the day and neglect uh, my wife. And so every now and then, 
I, I, I have to be, uh, the Lord helps me to every now and then remember to deliberately make time. Sneak away from my business. Just shut down all the other things and then pay attention to uh, my wife, even if it's for 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes. <clears throat> Amen. Intentional and purposeful. Great. Anybody else who wants to share? Mama Princess. Okay. If nobody else wants to share, then let's <clears throat> grapple these expectations and then we go to today's topic. So the first one is family planning. All right. Um, Shangela, what would you like to know about family planning? Should I just <clears throat> begin anywhere and end anywhere? Or is there anything specific <clears throat> you would like to be? Do you just want a general overview of family planning and my advice on family planning? Or <clears throat> what do you say? Therefore, all the advice on If you can write, you may feel free to write. All right. On family planning, family planning, uh, what does it refer to? It talks about, um, it encompasses deciding how many children you want to have, isn't it? That's the crux thereof. The crux, the crux of family planning is how many children do we want to have? And when, isn't it? And can we afford? And so, and so then the question is, what can be done about it? And then what shall we do? How, sh how shall we, how shall we proceed therefore uh, with uh, what we want to achieve? So as a married couple, as a Christian couple, uh, wanting to have children, planning to have children, or planning to get married, and you are thinking ahead about uh, children in, in wedlock with your husband, with your wife, there are certain things to consider, obviously. <clears throat> uh, number one, if you want to have children, it is advisable that you go to, to the doctor for um, medical test. Yeah, you go to the doctor for medical tests so that they may test to see if there is anything that may hamper, that may affect your, uh, your desire to have children, whether there are any polyps, any gynecologic issues. Um, I understand that uh, <clears throat> not all places have, have uh, quick access, not in, not in all places do people have quick access to doctors, but uh, all things being equal and you have the opportunity to, it is advisable to go to the, to the doctor uh, so that they can do some tests, STDs, uh, test for pelvic inflammatory diseases, uh, test for any physical obstructions, uh, for example, uh, polyps and um, fibroids and cysts in the gynecologic system that may affect the pregnancy or that it may affect the ability to fall pregnant. Uh, and also, as we learned last night, there was a, a pastor who wanted to fall pregnant. And then go, after going to the doctor, the doctor found out that she had a, a tumor in her brain, which was releasing prolactinoma, which was releasing prolactin. Yeah, it's a prolactinoma uh, tumor which was releasing prolactin. And prolactin is a, a hormone which inhibits all the other hormones, shuts down all the other hormones. Uh, which hormones, for example, we have uh, the follicular stimulating hormone. We also have the luteinizing hormone, which all act on the ovaries, also on the uh, uterus to prepare the uterus for implantation and for ovulation. The, 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 the ovary for ovulation. Therefore, if you have a tumor secreting prolactin or any carcinoid, carcinoid um, syndrome, or you have any tumor in the body that is releasing uh, prolactin, 
then uh, prolactin is going to shut down the release of luteinizing hormone and follicular stimulating hormone. So you are not going to have <clears throat> your normal menses uh, and you are not going to have the normal hormonal level of these hormones that are needed for ovulation and all these things. Therefore, <clears throat> if you are able to detect, if the doctor is able to detect that earlier, then you can test, uh, start the, next, the necessary treatment before attempting to fall pregnant with your husband. All right, so that's one mechanism for those that have such ability to go to doctors. And then uh, the men also need to have test, yeah? The men should also have tests done on STDs and maybe sperm counts and all these things uh, to see if, uh, uh, if, if everything is all right. That is one aspect. Now, what if uh, you're not worried about your ability to fall pregnant? You simply uh, don't want to fall pregnant immediately after you get married. What shall you do? How shall you uh, prolong uh, your waiting period before you fall pregnant and have children at the time when you are ready, financially, emotionally, spiritually, and otherwise? Uh, there are medications which have been developed uh, and these medications are used for various purposes. And uh, one of the purpose, purpose is, uh, of course, um, what is now the generic, or what is now the, the mostly associated term with uh, these medication, which is family planning for, um, they are called contraceptive pills. Right? So we have different contraceptive methods, not the least of which are uh, the progesterone, uh, hormonal treatment, the estrogen, hormone, estrogen and pro progesterone, hormonal treatments, then you have, uh, which are then dispensed in various ways via various mechanisms. You have the patch, you have the injection, you have, um, what else do you have? You have the IUD, intrauterine device, which can release the hormone. You also have a pill that they, you drink down. And the pill is in such a way that uh, you take it every single day, say for 28 days. And then during the days of menstrual cycle, <clears throat> you take some pills also, which have no effect on your body, but they trick you. They're, they're just for, for getting you into the habit of drinking pills every single day so you don't mess up your treatment, right? So then these pills, they control the, the uterus, they control the ovaries, they control mainly the uterus to prevent implantation from taking place. So they don't prevent um, ovulation. They merely prevent implantation from taking place. And, uh, but as a rule in medicine, uh, they, they are not 100%. They don't work 100%. Uh, the, the hormonal pill does not work 100%. You still have about, is it one to 3% of women that fall pregnant? And when you go to a doctor and you're on appeal, uh, and the doctor hears you saying that, um, I have stomach pain, doctor. And then the doctor asks you, are you pregnant? They say, no, I'm on appeal. So being on appeal to the doctor does not really mean much because the pill also allows people to fall pregnant <clears throat> sometimes. And so there is there is that risk of falling pregnant, <clears throat> and then the pill also have uh, okay. Let me not mention the side effects yet. Uh, that's the pill now. Uh, and then you have uh, the IUD that is copper. That one um, it's inserted, of course, and it only releases copper, not the hormone, not the hormone. Uh, th this one also this one prevents. Um, this one also thickens the isthmus and makes sure that there is no ovulation. Not, not ovulation, but make sure that there is no fertilization. Prevents the egg from meeting the sperm. And then you have, of course, the, the surgical techniques where the oviducts are cut or the surgical technique where the, <clears throat> where the vast difference are cut to prevent ejaculation and to prevent um, the egg from going from the ovaries to the uterus. 
therefore preventing the meeting of the sperm and the ovaries. I mean, not the ovaries, but the ovum, the ova, the egg, right? So these are some of the, <clears throat> these are some of the methods that are used. Um, other people, they use herbs, uh, herbs such as um, the neem tree and the, what's that tree? Uh, there is a tree called uh, Moringa tree, very healthy plants with benefits that benefit those that have um, various chronic diseases such as diabetes. However, these herb herbal treatments, they, um, they are abortifacients. They, <clears throat> they work like abortifacients. They prevent uh, implantation of the uterus of the, of the fertilized baby. And if there is a baby, they flush it out. If there's a baby that had implanted, then they flush it out. <clears throat> Let me welcome people that have joined recently. Um, Alfred Machuma. And uh, I also welcome Brother Christian with uh, Sister Minelia. Welcome from Chuarongo. Welcome, Brother Alfred. Uh, you, are, you have found me talking about... Um, addressing this first expectation here on family planning. And I've talked about different methods of family planning, but then there is one more. The other method of family planning is what we call the natural method, where you don't take any pills, you don't take any herbs, you just count the days. Yeah? You count the days and so that as husband and wife, then uh, you don't make you don't you do not make love on those days on which the <clears throat> on which you are highly likely to get to fall pregnant, right? And so you have then you have now to know what are the different you, you have to know how to calculate the days, which is uh, a problem for some brothers. Huh? Some brothers don't know how to count days. Some. Hmm? Yeah, these are the different, um, uh, you know, contraceptive methods. Okay, let me just um, finish with what I was saying. So, so you have to learn how to count the days. And then once you count the days, and then you ensure that uh, for the days when pregnancy, risk for pregnancy is high, uh, you do something else. What we call the manual method. And, and then on the days when there is, there is no chance of falling pregnant, and then you do your natural method. Okay. Um, what are the different side effects? The different side effects of IUDs, as I have drawn here, uh, the IUD can cause scars and strictures. Yeah, it can cause scars here. And uh, when it does that, and then it may uh, affect your chances of falling pregnant ever again. Sometimes they can also perforate. Sometimes the IUDs can also perforate and leave scars in the uterus, which can affect your chances of falling pregnant. If you use um, the hormonal methods, uh, the hormonal methods increases your chance of getting, sorry, but it increases the chance of, uh, number one, blood clots in the body. Women who take uh, contraceptive pills, they are 10 times more likely to develop a blood clot than an average person. What is it that causes blood clot? Three mechanisms, hypercoagulability, vessel injury, and uh, uh, sedentary or stasis. Uh, so hypercoagulability, that's when the blood is more likely to clot. There are in, there's an increase in clotting factors or an increase in those um, elements that increase uh, clotting. And, and contraceptive methods are some of those culprits, culprits that increases uh, your chance of falling, uh, of, of, of getting um, blood clots. Just give me a minute.
Okay, I'm back. I hope everybody can hear me. Good. So that's now the uh, contraceptive method that involves hormone therapy. Um, and uh, because it's, out, it's also abortifacient, that's how it works. And then IUD, as we mentioned, IUD increases strictures, which can affect your fertility also. Senior Bishop, yes? uh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but um, you will give us these notes, right? So that we can, because I'm making notes, <laughs> Uh, because normally I see that you always post notes, but all these things which you're saying, uh -huh. it's like in detail, I want to, you know, write down everything. So, okay, I will slow are you going to provide notes with that or yes? Uh, I'm making a recording. Uh, I'm not typing right now. Uh, I'm not typing right now or draw, drawing anything, uh, but, but you access the video. Amen. Thank you. Yeah, the video Thank will you. be available. I'll put it on YouTube so that you can watch and refresh and i'll put the audio on um, on our telegram group yeah, great thank you. um of course if you cut the if you cut if you decide to cut if you decide to to have your contraceptive method of cutting here and here then uh you'll never fall pregnant again if you decide to cut the vast difference then you also never fall pregnant again so that is it and but then the natural method the golden method i call it the golden method this one allows you to, uh, okay, here we are. Okay, so you have, of course, then there is also condoms there. Um, somebody asked, are condoms allowed? <laughs> this is your decision. All these methods are to, you decide between you and your husband or you and your wife, yeah? So you must consider all, all, all options. Um, <clears throat> so there you have it, the condoms there, IUD, scopa, and hormonal. And then you have the pill, which is also hormonal, injection, and patch. These are all hormonal. And then, as I said, hormonal methods, they increase your risk of clots, um, which increase your risk of deep vein thrombosis, which can lead to pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism is a thing that is, calling, that is killing COVID patients. So uh, that's now look at this. If you if you take IUD, if you take hormonal treatment, which increases your risk of clots, and then you get COVID nineteen, which increases the risk of clot, and then I guess you are twenty times more likely to get blood clots and pulmonary embolism. So I would I would advise you to stay away from hormonal methods if you don't need it medically. So it increases hypercoagulability. All right, and I mentioned about abortifacient and women still falling pregnant despite the pill. So the pill, just like the condoms, they also have the risk of uh, falling pregnant. All right. So some people have the withdrawal method. The withdrawal method is, um, is tricky. It's probably the least effective of all these methods because uh, you can't really control yourself that much. <laughs> and you may, you may end up ejaculating before you withdraw. All right. Counting the days. Counting the days allow, this is now, where you, uh, you, you, you supplement natural intercourse on the days before, on the days when you are, there is no risk of falling pregnant, together with the manual method on the days when uh, there is risk of falling pregnant. I think this is the safest method, the surest method, and it works. And it requires teamwork for both husband and wife to understand the days and to learn how to count the days together. And, and this is where your intimacy really is built when you can work things out together. Um, it requires a lot of patience and self-control. And also you're not missing out on anything because uh, everything is well spaced out. Okay, so I've mentioned the pros and cons. Okay, the only thing with the, with the, with the counting the days, the golden method is you won't have uh, intercourse every single day of the month. <laughs> but um, uh, that, that should not be a problem unless if uh, somebody needs help. Help in the sense of um, someone's sex drive is so high that uh, they cannot uh, have a week pass without having intercourse, then, uh, then, then uh, probably they need help. Okay, that is on family planning. Did I touch anything 
did I did I miss out on anything, Shangela? Anything that you wanted me that you wanted to uh, to be addressed? Okay, how will I plan? So 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 all these, whichever method you choose, you need to work together with your husband, with your spouse, with your wife, um, and and decide together on the method that suits you both, that you are both satisfied with, and. Uh, so that no one is forced into anything that uh, they are not comfortable with. And as I said, once you go to the doctor, the doctor will be able to do ultrasound, to do blood tests like full blood count, white cell, now blood group, recess factor. This is now when you are ready to fall pregnant, yeah? Um, uh, uh, human papilloma virus, uh, herpes simplex viruses, there are so many types. And then we'll be able to rule out fibroids, sexually transmitted diseases, sexually transmitted infections, such as chlamydia, gonorrhea, HIV, uh, syphilis, uh, pelvic inflammatory diseases, such as uh, vaginosis and strictures and cysts and all those things that can be associated with infertility. All right. Well, and a host of other stuff. Okay, good. I think that is well covered. Uh, Shangela, if uh, you need any more, if you want, if there is something that I didn't touch, please let me know. All right, what about how to protect one another from going down the wrong path? That's a very wonderful uh, question, Pastor Whitney. Considering that as husband and wife, uh, you are the, the first church, yeah? This is the first church here. The basic unit of society is marriage. And therefore, if marriage goes south, then society will go south. And you can really trace down to all our <clears throat> societal ills, all the confusion that is going on today globally. You can bring it down to break down. You can bring it down. You can narrow it down to marriage gone bad. We have about 50% of couples divorcing every single year. You're welcome, Sister Teresa. Uh, every single year, 50% of couples are divorcing because they don't know. They don't know how to uh, handle their marriages. They don't know how to nurture their marriages. Uh, and therefore, um, to avoid going down the wrong path, it's really a complex involves a lot of things. To guard one another going down the wrong path as a couple involves a host of things. And marriage counseling is one of those. Having a solid uh, foundation of church fellowship is, an, is, is also one of those things. And having a, a strong spiritual life, um, prayerful and prayerful life and um, uh, um, marriage that is built on the word of God. Now, there is accountability that is involved in marriage between uh, husband and wife, that you have to remember that um, as husband and wives, uh, you, you indeed have to... Oh, Pastor Whitney was not here. Oi, 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 oi. Pastor Whitney, can you hear me, Pastor Whitney? Uh, Ryan? Yes, I'm back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, were you around when I started discussing the, your question? Uh, no, I wasn't. I'm sorry. Ah, great. Uh, I, I'm, I'm now addressing the issue of uh, guarding one another from going down the wrong path. Amen. Yeah. Uh, and I was saying that... Um, let me see. Okay. I was saying that... I was saying that uh, protecting one another, guarding one another involves a host of things, not the least of which, Brother Christian, good to see you. <laughs> Amen, welcome, please. Greetings to your wife. Is she, is she at home? Amen. Yes, something to you. Tell her we are saying hi. Oh, okay, thank you, Bishop. Amen. Amen. Good to have you here. 
Great. <laughs> so, uh, protecting one another, guarding one another. I was saying, indeed, marriage is the basic unit of society, is the basic building block of our nations, the basic building block of, our, of, our, of the earth, really, of humanity on earth. And if things go rama, go south, go bad in marriage, then you can, from that breakdown in marriage, from there, you can trace how things have gone wrong until you, today. Or, or in other ways, you can do reverse engineering and trace our problems of today all the way back to where marriage started going wrong. Yeah? Whether it's the problem of gun crimes, knife crimes, youth in alcoholism, girls in prostitution, all these things can be stamped back to fatherless homes, can be stamped back to broken families, broken marriages, uh, where husband and wives are not taking their responsibility as fathers and mothers and husbands and wives that they should. Uh, therefore, a marriage that is on the right path, neither going left or right, is indeed the building block of society that will allow um, our nations to overcome some dangerous headwinds. In any case, of course, this now uh, brings into focus um, the fact that um, we have to protect one another, we have to guard one another. And part of that guarding involves, of course, having marriage fellowship, you know, uh, having a place where you can refill, you nourish your, 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 yourselves. Yeah, as couples, where you can be nourished and refilled and, and challenged and encouraged uh, and, and taught a place like this as we are today. Uh, it's a very good, it's a very good uh, um, platform to have. And then having a, a solid uh, church fellowship, a, ch solid, a, a very good place to call uh, church, uh, to call home, a church to call home, where you receive uh, good spiritual nourishment. Yeah, if you go to a church where, um, where they, 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 they promote homosexuality and uh, the pastor, the pastor is a homosexual who was married to his wife, but then divorced his wife so that he can marry his boyfriend, Lord have mercy. <laughs> then uh, the, what are you doing in such a church eh? and expect your marriage to flourish? <laughs> yeah, you can never have wrong teachings and expect to flourish. And you see that when there is apostasy at the pulpit, um, then uh, the family follows suit. One of the pastors recently, he was a very famous pastor globally. He wrote a book on uh, on dating and relationship. Uh, when he when he decided to recant his teachings. <laughs> to recant his teaching and his position on relationships and his position of biblical teachings. Then, no sooner he gave up becoming being a pastor, immediately he also divorced his wife. So definitely a strong church foundation is important for a strong marriage. So you must have a good church fellowship. All right, and then I mentioned good church fellowship. I mentioned good uh, fellowship with brethren like this where we have today. Because then that allows you both to be in the same stream of thought, yeah, to be receiving the same food uh, and, uh, and to be of the same mindset, really. Um, and then, then now there is this personal accountability now in marriage where uh, you now um, help each other on a daily basis as husband and wife. And that personal accountability, of course, you must ensure that in your home, you have developed an environment of spiritual growth, reading the Bible and praying together, yeah? And, uh, and serving together. And of course, we cannot forget communication that we were talking about earlier. If you want to be able to have an opportunity to speak to your wife anyhow, I mean, at any time, and she'll be able to receive your advice, then you must build a good foundation of communication. 
you must nourish good communication in your marriage. If your communication is not good, then when either of you begin to do something that is not right, it will be difficult to resolve that issue because uh, to begin with, uh, your communication is bad. So bad communication, and then forget about correcting one another because anytime one of you tries to correct the other, then it will come out always as, um, it will always turn into a war of words and guns blazing and bazookas being thrown from left and right uh, here and there. So you must build good communication, nurture good communication, develop communication skills between you and your wife, which of course uh, entails appreciating one another as, as, as spouses, appreciating one another, appreciating one another, honoring one another, respecting one another, and loving one another, building trust. Amen? On the, on the foundation of trust, you build good communication. Well, you can argue which one comes first, trust or communication. <laughs> the fact is, have trust and build trust and build communication. Once these are well established, then it becomes easy so that if husband begins to believe wrong doctrine, <laughs> then it is easier for wife to correct. When husband, when wife begins to believe wrong doctrine, then it's easier for husband to come in and say, uh, honey, uh, I think uh, this is not right, yeah? In fact, you must develop your, 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 your marriage so well to such an extent that um, you are both, as I said, flowing, flowing in the same stream of, of thought, of, of spiritual understanding, so that if there is something that you, have, that you are learning and you share it with your wife, so there is this ease of, of sharing of information. When, 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 when you are receiving a new teaching, when you're receiving some revelation, some grand revelation, then you share with your wife. If your wife's spirit is disturbed, she should have a freedom. She should be free to speak and say, pasta, pasta, I think that's not right. <laughs> yeah, I think that guy is not telling the truth. Or I think that revelation that you got is not right. All right, and vice, vice versa. If uh, with that good foundation, wife comes up with a powerful revelation and comes to husband and say, Hus hubby, I've learned something very powerful from our Bible study today. <laughs> And it becomes easier to correct one another and say, ah, me, I don't agree with that, um, with that teacher's uh, uh, rendition of the scripture or anything, yeah? So you must nurture good communication. It allows you to correct one another verbally. Amen? It allows you to correct one another and to listen to one another. And of course, must be respectful must be respectful in all, our, in all our corrections. When we are correcting one another, we must be very, very respectful to God, protect one another. Also, uh, as, as we're thinking about protecting one another from going down the wrong path, uh, uh, you cannot forget about the five love languages, which I'm not sure we have discussed. Have we discussed five love languages? Uh, who has been here for too long? Pastor Ovasia uh, Maria. <laughs> You are the longest attend attendee here. Okay. Obasi Amalia, have we discussed love languages? Pastor Emily, have we discussed love languages here? Probably not. Oh, not, not, we haven't. Okay, we haven't. Okay, we shall make time to discuss five love languages. So I'm not forgetting the five love languages because uh, we, we, we tend to, res to, to, uh, to respond easier when we feel loved in marriage, yeah? If you're with your husband and you don't feel loved, then it becomes difficult to receive other correct, any correction, yeah? But in any case, uh, whether you feel loved or not, remember love and respect. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And in this way, uh, you'll be able to correct one another uh, when you love and respect one another. Biblical correction. Biblical correction, now this entails uh, apostasy now uh, to ensure that um, one of us is not believing false teachers or one of us is not um, 
introducing false doctrine to our children or whichever way, yeah? Uh, again, a lot of humility. Uh, again, a lot of uh, nurturing communication. It's, it's no different really. But ensure that you yourself as, as the husband or the wife that wants to correct the other person, ensure that uh, you are really grounded. Yeah, ensure that you are really grounded on the true word before you try to correct the other person. So maybe so that you don't end up trying to correct, but then actually your correction is the one that is leading the other person astray. So, so uh, biblical correction, uh, that again, that entails um, ensuring that in your marriage, uh, you are in one stream of thought of spiritual understanding. That as you do your Bible reading, um, if you are able to, if you are able to, if you're able to read your Bible every day with your wife, kudos, that's very powerful. Then do it, yeah? Um, if you're able to pray um, every single day with your wife, uh, please do it. These help to, um, yes, to avoid all of that. Uh, this, uh, this provides a good opportunity to, to correct one another uh, if there is any biblical misunderstanding. Any doctrinal errors. Answering well and asking well. This brings us back to our famous scripture from the book of, is that uh, James chapter 3? Quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Let me read it. Be slow. Okay, let me read it. Let me read it. How can we? Uh, answer well and uh, and ask each other well. Eh? Slow to speak. One thing I've, I've realized from our first year of marriage is the fact that um, we are always right in our own eyes. Yeah. Uh, we are more often right in our own eyes and we are very hard on our spouses and easy and easy on ourselves, yeah? So when, when you do any, something wrong, you get yourself off the hook. You don't scrutinize yourself too much. You don't condemn yourself, but your spouse does something, your microscopic eyes are on her, or your electron microscope, your Hubble microscope eyes are on her, telescope, this is even a telescope. Your Hubble telescopic eyes are there on her to do, to, 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 to see any small mistake or any big mistake she's making. And we are very quick to downplay. You downplay your own, your own uh, actions, and then you amplify her wrongs. Yeah, you downplay your wrongs, you amplify her wrongs. So you have to balance well. You have to realize that you have to be realistic and not have uh, too much expectation in the sense that you expect your wife to be perfect or expect uh, yourself to be, to not be imperfect, yeah? So knowing that we are, as human beings, we, we error and uh, we also need grace. We need to be very gracious to one another. And as gracious, in that spirit of graciousness to one another, uh, we, in James chapter one, verse 19, then remember that James 19 say, 1, 19 says, we must be slow to speak. Let me read it here. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. Slow to speak. We must be slow to speak. R R R James chapter 1. Just 1. 19. Or is it chapter 9? Verse 9. Just 1. 9. James 1. 9. Did I get that correct? Nope, James 1.19. My dear brothers, okay, here it is. Here it is. I think this is the golden advice. This one, this one, you can never find anything that beats this one, this advice. You can never find any advice that beats this one. <laughs> you, can, you can take this to the bank with a big fat check. Very good, thank you so much. Thank you so much. 
for, for sharing the scripture there, Pastor, with me. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Be mindful of this. Remember this always. This applies to both married couples and unmarried couples, and it works all the time. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. Where? And this is where we get things wrong. This is where we, uh, our, convers- our, our communication go nasty in our relationships, in our marriages. They go nasty when we are not quick to listen. Yeah? When we are not slow to speak, when we are quick to get angry. So if you want to be able to, um, to ask well, let's say you want to answer well to uh, you, you want to answer well when your wife speaks to you, or you want to answer well when your husband speaks to you, then be quick to listen and really listen. When they say something, don't be, don't let your feelings do you boil so quickly? Some of us have hot temper. You know, we are born again, but tem- the temper is so hot and so quick uh, and impatient also, impatient with our spouses when they speak. So you need to be, to slow down, slow down, and then listen. If your wife says something and you feel like she insulted you, <laughs> yeah, if in doubt, especially when you feel like uh, you heard the wrong stuff, the bad stuff, especially if you feel like you're, you, you are offended. Always ask for clarification. Yeah, always ask for clarification. Did I hear you say that uh, I finished the chocolate that you left yesterday? <laughs> are, you, are you saying that you don't want me to drink this Coca-Cola in the fridge? I don't drink Coca-Cola. Either. Yeah. Yeah. Am I hearing you saying that you are not coming home until eight o'clock? You see? And really listen before you lash out, before you answer and say and say whatever you want to say. Yeah? Really listen. And once you listen and you establish the facts, I found out that about 90% of my assumptions are wrong. <laughs> when, when I assume that my, my wife did not, uh, I mean, when I assume that my wife said one thing, which I don't like, and then I realized, and then, and then I asked for clarification, I realized that my assumptions were totally off. Were totally off. And so it always helps, helps me to ask her to clarify. Okay, what did you say? And, and, and also when you ask, uh, what did you say? Can you please clarify yourself? That allows you to recompose yourself. <laughs> yeah. Allows you to comp- compose your feelings, compose your emotions, compose your answers, compose your whatever that you have there. If you are busy arming yourself with some bazookas in your mouth there, then you disarm yourself quickly. <laughs> yeah. So you listen. You listen and then slow to speak. And then slow to get angry. Slow to speak. When you feel offended, you want to burst. You feel under pressure. You want to burst out immediately. You want to speak immediately. Uh, so you have to learn to, to not speak immediately. If you need time out, then ask for time out. You say, uh, can you just give me a moment? Just give me a moment. Let me think about what you just said, for example. <laughs> yeah? your, your wife says something that you don't like. Then you say, just give me a moment. Let me think about it. <laughs> give me five minutes and then you compose yourself for those five minutes and then you give the answer you know, maybe if you are the wife you take those two three more minutes and then you give your answer that is appropriate hallelujah it's appropriate okay uh, i think does that suffice there to answer does that, that does do these questions i mean do these answers suffice uh pastor whitney I think this very very well brought brought forth. Great. And oh, oh, I didn't stress on the asking. The asking part is the same. If if what if if 
if what you want to ask is, did you go to the shops? <laughs> you know, of course, uh, uh, going to the shop can be associated with a lot of things. But if what you want to ask is something that is a hot topic, <laughs> think well before you ask. Yeah. Think very, very well over your words, your choice of words. And um, yeah, and once you do that, you give careful thought over your words and you are slow to speak, slow to get angry. And then uh, I think you'll be on the right, in the right direction, in the right direction to go to marital bliss. <laughs> Great, beautiful. I think we have handled those. We have grappled with those. Amen, amen. We have grappled with those. Now, what is marriage covenant? Let us turn to uh, the book of um, um, Malachia. Malachia. Malachia chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Before we read Malachia, I want to ask you guys, please don't leave me hanging. Please try to answer me. Even if... Um, Good. Thank you. Thank you, Changelo. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. Good. Uh, even if um, you don't know the full answer, just try. Okay. When you hear the word covenant, what comes to your mind? Uh, I think for me personally, what comes to my mind when I hear the word covenant. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing that comes is agreement. Agreement. Good. Mm -hmm. I think uh, what I think the first thing which comes to my mind is um, commitment. Commitment. Excellent. Dear. Commitment. Anybody else? What comes to mind when you hear covenant? Commitment, I yes. commit, meaning I give myself to this. Mm -hmm. Who is it that, that wanted to speak? Union. Union, unity. Uh -huh. There is a covenant in the Bible called union. Uh -huh. Is that Shangelao? Thank you so much. Union. Ah, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, union. What else? It, it's a rare word these days, eh? We don't hear of covenant so much except in the scriptures, isn't it? <laughs> For some of us, we don't hear so much about covenant. We only hear agreement or we hear, we, we hear um, contract. Is covenant and contract the same thing? What do you think? Contract. If they are not the same, what do you think is the difference? Anybody? Что это такое? Что это значит? Что это такое agreement? Not agreement, but uh, covenant and contract. Covenant. Covenanting versus contract. What is the difference? <clears throat> Are they the same? Praise the Lord, blessed senior bishop. Yes, praise the Lord. But let me try. Mm -hmm. I think uh, contract uh, uh, it's an, a, a temporary agreement, mm -hmm. while uh, covenant is an, a, a permanently agreement. Mm -hmm. You say covenant is permanent, the, eh? mm -hmm. whereas. Uh, Con Contract, it's a, a temporary agreement. Amazing. We're saying covenant et uh, permanent. Eh? <laughs> what is permanent in, uh, in, in Lithuanian, Pastor Sanil? Contract is, uh, what did you say? Short term or what did you say? Temporary. Temporamente, okay, temporary. Temporary. <laughs> Close to the bed. <laughs> Contract is temporary and covenant is permanent. Okay, does it? 
Is there yes. anybody who's, who agrees or disagrees? Anybody who agrees, disagrees? Uh, praise the Lord. Yeah, hallelujah. Yeah, for me, I, I agree to a certain extent. Okay. That in the covenant is something permanent. Uh -huh. And uh, contract, it's not really simple because you know, it's a long term contract, but it's something that can be broken compared okay. to a. Uh, but I think maybe the same. So I agree with the temporary, yes. Yeah. So okay, you are saying it's not just temporary, but it can be broken. It may be longer. <laughs> yes, so you're saying apart from it being temporary, it can be broken. Okay, broken, broken. Mm -hmm. Lama? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, what I about covenant? Can it be broken? Uh, yes. Co covenant seems to be like when it's like agreement, you agree, mm -hmm. and you have a free will, you can break it also. <laughs> okay, and you're saying a covenant you really can also anything, be broken. When it comes to contract, uh -huh. but when it comes to contract, contract is like you abide by those rules and laws, mm -hmm. and when you break it, there are certain consequences which follows that. So it's like you're in, it's like once you break, consequences, but with covenant, I guess it's more of like agreement and union. It's more free. Oh, interesting things here. Okay, you are saying uh, broken, there is consequence to breaking a covenant, a, a, a contract. Contract. Right? And yes, covenant is like, you're more free. You are like agreeing with, with each other. So you're saying you are more free so to break, break it. Yes. Without consequence. Okay. Does any does anybody agree with this? Pastor Alex, do you agree? Do you agree that if I if if, if, if we break a break, if we break, let's speak some unless uh -huh. unless unless covenant uh -huh. is carrying a law. Unless is, unless covenant is carrying a contract. Okay. Or in other words, law. Unless the covenant <laughs> so it can be consequential. Is carrying a con uh, now you are teaching us interesting things here. So you are saying a contract can be within a covenant. And if the contract is in a covenant, then that covenant cannot be broken. It can be broken, but it has consequences. Okay, now you're saying that now there are consequences. If there is no contract in the covenant, no consequence, okay? Because, a, for example, uh -huh. God made covenant with Abraham, but he didn't give him the law. So, uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. I guess for him, the faith was his righteousness. He was not demanding certain days, certain, you know, like Shabbat and everything. But to Israelites, he gave law. He made covenant with by giving them the law. Okay, but the you know the blood thing, he made covenant with the blood, so I think you know that's the thing like covenant with the law, and covenant which is just by faith, like you agree, like Abraham agreed with God, and that was conveyed to him as righteousness, uh -huh. <laughs> and there is another righteousness which come by law, like okay. in covenant you are given law. Okay, I want me to welcome somebody that and you bring it to consequence. Yes, I'll, I'll give you to continue. Let me well, let me welcome two people that just joined us. Uh, Pastor Alex, uh, Mama Alex Dieve, Mama, P, Mama, 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 Mama Dieve. Mama Dieve, welcome over there on uh, Telegram. I hope you can hear all the conversation going on here. Please let me know if you can hear. And uh, I would also like to welcome uh, Monica Shifotoka that just joined us. Welcome, Monica. We're blessed to have you join us today. If you can hear me, please let me know. Please let me know if you can hear me. We are discussing um, <clears throat> covenant versus contract. Our topic is uh, the marriage covenant. And uh, this is uh, Christ-Centered Marriage Fellowship. And as a fellowship, we discuss, we ask questions, we answer questions, and we deliberate 
and we seek understanding so that uh, we can, the Lord can be glorified in our marriages. We have uh, uh, discussed the issue of family planning. We have discussed the issue of uh, correcting one another as a couple, communication. And then uh, we, uh, we also heard from Avasi Amalia discussing how she has learned the important nuggets she learned from a conflict resolution, as you can see them there. And now we are talking about uh, marriage covenant. We are now talking about the marriage covenant. And um, we define, we started off defining what is a covenant and uh, uh, some uh, definitions that came up there is that it is an agreement, a commitment and a union. And uh, then I said, uh, there is such a thing as a contract. Is it the same as a covenant? Uh, if not, then what is the difference? If there is any difference at all. Therefore, we are now grappling with this, with this topic, all right? We will, we will uh, grapple with this for the rest of our session, all right? Yes, Pastor Sanil, you are saying that uh, a covenant can be broken without consequence, but if there is, but if it's based on law, or if it's built upon a covenant, I mean, if within the covenant there is a contract, then it cannot be annulled without consequence. Uh, all right, uh, we have um, Sister Teresa, who said that uh, a covenant is permanent and must be fulfilled. In her words, she said, is to be fulfilled. So she disagrees with, uh, with you on that point, that she said it is to be fulfilled, whereas a contract has a duration. All right, uh, anybody else who want to weigh in before I run with it? Brother Chris, what say you? Do you agree that a covenant can be broken without consequence? No, not 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 really. Mm -hmm. Because uh, for you to have a, a covenant, I believe it's also an agreement. Mm -hmm. So you both agree, both sides agree that it should be like this and this. Mm -hmm. And I believe if any agreement is uh, broken, there mm -hmm. should be consequences. Because mm -hmm. uh, the Bible calls, it, calls marriage a covenant. Yes. And then for you to that covenant of marriage, the agreement was made. It's mm -hmm. because in the world, uh, some of the consequences, you lose your building, you lose your work. That's what happens. That's the consequences mm -hmm. of what happens in the world. Yes. So spiritually, there's also consequences. So I believe both, uh, it's more specific to the covenant, mm -hmm. there's consequences. I don't know if really there are much consequences to, to uh, break. Or maybe there are some consequences, but I don't think they are SKVS for a, a covenant. Because mm -hmm. most of the time when we break our contract in the world, it only affects not really, the, how should I say, it doesn't affect you so much really compared mm -hmm. to only physically. Because when you break your contract in this you break your contract, all you lose is maybe the money that you're supposed to get. Uh, the company might not hire the next time, but usually it gives you a reason mm -hmm. why you can break the contract that you have uh, signed. They call it termination of contract. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what they put now in this area. But you hardly hear termination of government. But we have such a way you terminate your contract with a letter that I want to terminate just A, B, C, C, D. Then you send, they say, okay, fine, you can send the letter of termination and then your contract is terminated. But that's unlikely with uh, covenant. Mm -hmm. Unlikely with the covenant. Great. Now, excellent. Uh, a covenant. Let, let me go back to the covenant there. Let us read first. First of all, let us read uh, uh, Malachi. Malachi chapter 2. Who wants to read for us? So that I don't do all the talking. So that I don't do 100% or 90% of the talking. <laughs> Monica, I hope you can hear us. If you, um, I hope you can hear us. Please let us know, even in a chat. If you're at work, you can send an SMS there just to let us know that you can hear. Um, Malachi chapter two. 
there's um aha there we go we 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 <laughs> Okay. Who wants to read for us these letters in purple? We're starting verse um, verse 13. Who wants to read for us the words in purple from verse 13? Yes, uh, Bishop. Malachi chapter. Malachi chapter 13. No, the, the chapter. I sorry, man. Malachi chapter two, verse thirteen, all the way to the end of the chapter. Yeah. Okay, all the way to verse um sixteen. Malachi chapter two, from ten up to verse sixteen, and read as follows. From thirteen to sixteen. Another thing you do. Uh huh. Thirteen to sixteen. Amen. Another thing you do, you flood the left either with ear, eat and wait because it no longer looks a favor on your offering or them with pleasure from your hand. Mm. You ask, why? Because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You be unfaithful to her, though she is the wife. Of your marriage covered in tears. Has not the one God made you? You belong to Him in body and spirit, and that does the one that seeks godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and devotes his wife, says the Lord, the God of Israel. That bound to the one who should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. Amen. Hallelujah. So is the covenant in is breaking a covenant inconsequential? Inconsequential, that's the word. The answer is no. There is a consequence to breaking the covenant. The Lord here defines marriage. As a covenant. He calls it marriage covenant. The covenant, he says, that you have made with the wife of your youth. Referring now to, of course, um, uh, marrying, of course, just marriage covenant. Marrying your wife, marrying your husband. Yeah. And whenever uh, the Lord swore to his people, made a swearing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Whenever the Lord made a swearing to his people, a solemn swear, made a solemn swear, it is always, he always swore by himself in heaven, by, his, by, by himself. And that swearing, that, that oath that he takes is a covenant that he makes with man. And here is the one thing with the covenant. Covenants cannot be broken. Hallelujah. <laughs> I said cannot be broken. Cannot and must not be broken. And there is a serious consequence to breaking covenants. Because when you make a covenant, you swear to your hurt. Let me say that again. When you make a covenant, a covenant must not be broken and cannot be broken. I, I, I said broken. Look at my spelling errors here. A covenant must not be broken. A covenant cannot be broken. And when it is broken or attempt thereof is made, then there is serious 
consequence hitherto. <laughs> hitherto. There is serious consequence there, there uh, as a result. There is a serious consequence to that breaking. And I say it, when it comes to marriage covenant, when it comes to marriage covenant, when it comes to covenant, making a covenant, a covenant is made to one's own hurt. Did you see that? To one's hurt. What does that mean? To one's hurt means you keep it even if it means dying. <laughs> Hallelujah. Even if, even if it means suffering for it. <laughs> yeah. To one's hurt means you will keep it even if it means death. In other words, till death do us part. <laughs> Hallelujah. Uh, till death do us part. The only thing that will break it is death. The only thing that will annul it is death. To one's hurt, even if you suffer, even if you suffer for it, you will not break it. Amen. He says, this is my covenant that I make with you today. He said, this is the bread. This is the bread of the covenant. He says, this is my bread broken for you. He says, this is the, the blood of the new covenant poured out for you. Keep it until I come. Do this as often until I come. He said, they loved not their lives even unto death. Hallelujah. And so you live your lives to protect this so that the covenant, therefore, is a treasure to be protected with one's own life. <laughs> is a treasure to be protected with one's own life. Ay, ay, ay. You keep it to your hurt. Now, let us turn to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew, Matthew chapter 19, I think it's 19, 4, 4 to 6 or 3 to 6, let's see. Matthew chapter 19. Marriage covenant. So a covenant is not to be broken, cannot be broken, must not be broken. Only death can interfere. Okay, it's not 19. Is it 19? Matthew, not Malachi. Matthew. And you keep it to your hurt. Even if it means suffering, even if it means dying, you will keep it until you die. So a covenant is not convenient. It's not a matter of convenience. Whereby you keep it if you like, and if you don't like, then you don't keep it. So a covenant is not a matter of convenience. Amen. You see, we, we are living in a generation that does not honor covenants, that has turned its backs on covenants. But if we are going to flourish and, ex and exemplify and glorify Christ in our marriages, then we have to grab this, we have to get this and assimilate this and then have our bearings right. Amen. Then have our bearings right. Yeah. He says, cannot be broken, must not be broken, is not a matter of convenience. What is convenience? Convenience is if I feel if I feel like stomach ache today, then 
I can change my mind. <laughs> if I feel headache tomorrow, then I can take it up. Yeah, convenience. It's a matter of comfort and, and, and you know, if, if it benefits me now, then if it can allow me to get bread today, then I take it. If it does not allow me to get uh, petrol tomorrow, then I will abandon it. And then I play dice with it like that. <laughs> there is no, it's not a matter of what? It's not a matter of convenience. Okay. Malachi, I'm not Matthew. Matthew, Matthew chapter 19. Mateus. Mateus. Mateus, one of the powerful treaties on marriage. Mateus chapter 19, from verse 3. Um, over there on Telegram, can you still hear me? Matthew chapter 19 says, Some people came to him to test him. Some Pharisees. Some Pharisees came to Jesus. They came to him to test him, to provoke him, <laughs> to check him out. They came to test his limits, to test him. They say, how far can you go? They say, they asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Hey, look at that now, convenience. You see that convenience speaking there? <laughs> he says, any and every. If I want bread today, then I can break it. If it is not allowing me to, 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 to get the car that I want, then I break it. Any and every reason. If, uh, if it is hindering me from going for a holiday, then I break it. <laughs> if it gives me headache, then I break it. You say, is it, is it lawful for any and every? This really encompasses anything that you would like to think of. Have you not read? Haven't you read? Do you not know? Are you not aware? Knowest not thou. <laughs> Haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, in the beginning, Nachale, the creator made them male and female. Okay. He says, made them male and female. And then he said, for this reason, a man, a man shall leave his father and mother and be united. All right. Somebody said covenant means union. All right. So now we have our union here and be united to his wife. Uh, is it King James that says, and cleave to his wife. And the two shall become uno, one flesh. One flesh, not two. They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, as a consequence, as a result, it follows then that what God has joined together Look at that. Let no one separate. Then what happens if somebody is separated? We'll find out. Yeah? We'll find out what is the consequence of trying to separate and breaking this covenant. But he says, have you not read in the beginning? Okay, let us go to the beginning. Genesis. Number okay, 21, chapter 1, verse 20, 20, let's see, 26. Okay. Have, have you not read? Okay, then here we read Matthew, uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. Genesis chapter 1, verse 25. Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Why? So that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. 
male and female, he created them. And then he blessed them. Then he blessed them. If you go to chapter 2, is it chapter 2? Chapter 2. Chapter 2 of Genesis. So chapter 2 of Genesis, verse 21, he says, So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. <laughs> deep trance, deep sleep. He, he put him under anesthesia. Without proper fall. <laughs> without uh, painkillers. Without our natural pain, our, our, our earthly painkillers. That's it. God's, God's painkiller is natural also. <laughs> natural painkiller. Just that it's not natural to our world. <laughs> it's natural to the other world. So he puts him under some deep anesthesia, deep sedation. <laughs> and while he was sleeping, then he took one of the men's ribs and taking them, he closed up the place with the flesh. Then the Lord God, then the Lord God made a woman from the rib. So this is powerful. So when he took the rib and then closed up with the flesh, then he embedded that in human DNA. Oh, that is powerful. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man. And then he formed the woman and then he took her and then he brought her to the man and paraded her to the man and presented her to the man and exhibited her to the man and gave her to the man and brought her to the man. Then the man said, woman, <laughs> whoa, man. So the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woe man for she was taken out of man. <laughs> That is why, verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. Hallelujah. There was no shame on them. <laughs> so Jesus is saying, have you not read this passage? That when he established the marriage covenant in this institution, this marriage institution in this chapter, when he established it, when he confirmed it, when he appraised it, and he, and he, and he confirmed it, and then commissioned it forth. <laughs> when he established it, confirmed it, and established it, and sent it forth to reflect his image, to reflect the image of God. When he did that, he says, are you not aware? Have you not heard? That when he did that, it is not possible to destroy that. Hmm. That essentially became a union, an everlasting union. Unbroken, unbroken union. That cannot be broken. That you must not even attempt. Because then he invokes God in it. He says, so the maker made it and put them together. So if, if God puts the two together, then please don't interfere, right? <laughs> don't try to interfere. Who is the warning here? <laughs> he says, let no one separate. <laughs> what God has joined together, let no one separate. Who is he warning? Is he warning those outside the institution of marriage? He's warning everybody. Both outside and inside. Amen. Who, who is that? Let no one. Who is the no one? <laughs> the no one. He says, let no one. Let no one. Let no one man separate them. Let no one woman separate them. Let no one child separate them. <laughs> let no one father separate them. Let no one mother separate them. Let no one lawyer separate them. Let no one president separate them. Let no one pastor separate them. Let no one anything separate them. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because it says then, if anybody tries to break that, then they are assaulting, they are assaulting God himself. They are taking up a fight against God himself. Ah, they were troubled. You say, impossible. 
He said, no, this, is, this is not possible. Then why did Moses command the man to give a letter of divorce to his wife? They said, no, there is a precedence. They said, no, you did not read the, the law well. <laughs> if you had read the law, then you will find out that Moses allowed them to divorce. He gave them an easy way out. Just give divorce, divorce paper. Just go and get your lawyer, right? Just write there, he says, just get your lawyer right, incompatible. <laughs> what do they write these days? They write irreconcilable differences. <laughs> And, and, and then they said, that is, that is a reason enough. He said, no, Moses asked them to just write a certificate of divorce and then write their irreconcilable differences and send her away. Jesus said, are you not aware? That is lack of faith. Hardening of heart. The stiff neckness. <laughs> <laughs> Moses allowed that because of stick neckness. Did I say that right? Before, because of the stiff neck. When the Lord says A, the people don't want. They don't want to follow God's A. They want to go their B. When God says B, they say, no, we want F. <laughs> stiff necked, bound on their own ways. Lack of faith, because of your, he says, because your hearts were hardened. Hardening of hearts, it talks about faithlessness. Lack of faith in the Lord. He says, because of lack of faith, but that's not what God instituted in the beginning. And by the way, heaven goes by what he said in the beginning. <laughs> he said, I am the creator now, and I'm telling you that what stands is what is in the beginning. <laughs> that is the basis that is the basis irreconcilable difference does not give you a reason <laughs> does not give you a reason to put away your husband <laughs> or to put away your wife you think the creator did not know that they are different <laughs> hallelujah the creator knew that there would be differences of course he designed the differences he was not blind but it was not this way from the beginning. And I tell you, now look at this now. He says, now he says now, anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. Okay. Look at that. Commits adultery. And he was now talking during a time when they were very strict. You know, those days they were very, very strict. It was not easy to find. Uh, probably it was, I don't know. But they were very strict on the law. Those, those, are, those were the days where they stoned you, where they stoned the adulterers. So it was difficult to find the adulterers those days. Eh? <laughs> because you remember in John chapter 8, they brought the adulterer, the adulteress. And they say, look, there she is. Moses said, we must kill her because she has been sexually immoral. So you can just imagine how many other adulterers and adulterers they killed. So it must have been very difficult to end up to find yourself in such a situation of, uh, I know the flesh is uh, something else, but it must have been a difficult situation to find somebody. It must, it must have been rare to find somebody uh, running around with other people's spouses. In any case, he says, so they found it difficult. They say, no, this is not easy. <laughs> they thought you can just find any easy way out. Oh, I'm tired of this woman. She does not cook well. Let me just accuse her of immorality. <laughs> but then he says, the disciples said to him, if this is the situation between a husband and wife, then it's better not to marry, right? Now, there is something I want to draw attention to, because then he says, he says that if you put away your husband, okay, Luke 16, 18. Now let us look now at those that break the covenant. Let us look at those that break the covenant. Let us look at the consequence there. He says, anyone, Luke, Luke 16, 18. 
He says, um, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another, another woman. Now he's addressing the covenant breakers. Anyone who breaks this covenant, covenant of marriage now. Anyone who breaks this covenant, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another, another woman commits adultery. Hey. And he says, and then the man who marries a divorced woman also commits adultery. Hey. Look at that. Look, he's saying, the man, he says, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another. So the man divorces his wife. Look at that. And then enters adultery, immorality. And then he says, and then anybody who ends up marrying the woman who was divorced by the adulterer, anyone who marries her then will also be committing adultery. <laughs> Look at that. Say, according to God's law, there's still husband and wife. And therefore, breaking the covenant, divorcing the wife, does not change the status in heaven. That's why they will be, they will be punished. Of course, you see the adultery. There's, there's punishment for the adultery. Serious uh, punishment for the adultery. God himself will face the adulterer. He says, even though he marries another woman and divorces her, and it appears as if she's now free to marry someone else, he says, whoever marries her, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Commits adultery. Very scary things. But that's the covenant. You see that cannot be broken. Cannot be broken until he said in Romans chapter 6. Look at Romans chapter 6. Here. Romans chapter 6. Um, um, okay. Dead to sin. Dead to sin. How can we live in it no, no, any longer? Um, let me see here. Um, what you, the, the, the scripture I'm looking for, it is here, but I just can't find it. He says that just as when a woman, her husband dies, then she's free to marry somebody else. In the same way, when we die to sin, then we are free to be bound to Christ. Okay, here, Romans chapter 7. He says, we're talking about the marriage covenant. He says, do you not know, brothers and sisters, for I'm speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone as long as that person lives. For me, for as long as you live, that covenant is binding. It's a binding covenant. Then he says, for example, by law, a woman, a married woman, is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. Look at that. But if her husband dies, then she's released from that covenant. So then if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she's called an adulteress. And the same with the man. He's an adulterer. If he marries somebody else while he's married to her. But if her husband dies, she's released from that law and is, an, and, and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. You see that? That's why even as born again, we first had to die to sin so that we can be married to Christ. Because because if we do not die to sin and try to be married to Christ, then we are committing some uh, idolatry. Because we have not divorced sin. We have not, not divorced sin, but we have not died to sin. That's the word. We have not died to sin. We have not annulled the covenant with sin. That covenant must only be annulled by death. That's why we must die in water through baptism. <laughs> Amen. So that that covenant will be annulled and brought to nothing, and and uh, and then uh, dis disabled and totally, what is the word now? Um, dismembered, 
<laughs> dismembered. Hallelujah. So it says it is a binding covenant, binding for as long as you are alive, marriage covenant, and there is consequence. We see the consequence there. It says even if you leave your wife and then you marry somebody else, it says if somebody else tries to take over her, then uh, sexual immorality is taking place now. So these are fearful things, brothers. So we should really honor our marriages. All these, all saying all these to just bring the gravity to the importance of our marriage covenants, the treasure that we hold. Hallelujah. The treasure, it's a treasure. It's a treasure. Now go back to Malachi chapter two. Malachi chapter two, now he says, are you not aware that this covenant, this covenant, this marriage is a covenant and the Lord is the witness. Yeah, The Lord testifies. He witnesses the covenant. He testifies. He approves it. And then he what? He commissions it. Yeah. Then he says, and then this covenant is approval before it's approved before him because he's the author thereof. He's the author. So he approves it. And then as long as we, we stay faithful to the covenant, then the Lord also remains faithful to us. Yeah. And then his favor will be on us. You see that. And he will accept our prayers, our offerings. Our offerings and sacrifices as believers now, our prayers and our praise, our worship unto the Lord, our prayers unto the Lord, those are our sacrifices that we offer to God. Our sacrifice of thanksgiving. Our thanksgiving, our worship, our prayer, our praises, those are our sacrifices. And when we are faithful to our marriage covenants, when we're faithful to our husbands, faithful to our wives, honoring this covenant that, they, that we have made before the Lord, in the presence of the Lord, the Lord himself testifying as a witness, then he receives our prayers. Yeah, he receives our prayers. There's a place where he says, be careful how you treat one another so that your prayers are not hindered. There is a consequence to not honoring marriage covenant the marriage covenant yeah i think it's in the book of peter he said um so that your prayers are not hindered once i find it i'll read it all right that's first peter chapter three let's go to first peter chapter three first peter chapter three you see, the world today has really um, spoiled, what is the word? Has tried to annul, annul, to, uh, to water down, not just water down, but to really demean the value of marriage covenant. They made it a matter of convenience. Oh, if you want to get married and you don't want the person to destroy your business, then just uh, you know, sign a letter that says you will not touch my money, you will not touch my businesses, <laughs> you will not touch my. So we have greedy people who are getting married, who know nothing about marriage, <laughs> and they want to have a happy life, happy married, happy married life. Greedy people, greedy. Since when does greediness become the foundation of a successful marriage? Greedy. They say I have built my business. I don't want you to destroy my business. So please sign this letter that you will not touch my business so that if we divorce, then you will not take anything from my company. <laughs> Greedy people that know nothing about marriage are signing letters in, 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 in lawyers' offices. First Peter chapter three, verse six. Husbands, in the same way, be considerate as you, as you live with your wives and treat them with respect, or please, as the weaker partner and as heirs with you of the gracious gift of life 
Why? So that nothing will hinder your prayers. <laughs> you see that consequence there, Pastor? You, 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 you mistreat your wife? Forget about your prayers going through. So when you begin to say you mistreat your wife and then you are saying, I'm praying, but I feel like my prayers are not going through the roof, <laughs> through the ceiling. Maybe it's true because you are mistreating your, hus- your wife, <laughs> mistreating your husband, <laughs> breaking, being unfaithful to your covenant with your spouse. <laughs> Hallelujah. Maybe it's true. That when, when some of those people that like to say that their prayers are not going through the ceilings, maybe they are not going through the ceilings because <laughs> so there is just some angel there probably that is hindering the prayers from going further. I say, ah, not, not allowed. In any case, jokes aside, but you see that if we are faithful to our covenant, then the Lord's pleasure. You see, when the Lord receives your prayers, that is the Lord's pleasure upon your marriage. You see that? Upon you. The Lord's pleasure. The Lord's pleasure is the love of the Lord lavished upon you. Pleased with you. I go back to Matthew then. Therefore, what God put together, let no filthy hands try to put asunder. What God put together, let no dirty mouth try to destroy. What God has put together, let no evil heart try to destroy. Evil heart, the wicked heart of resentment and, 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 and jealousy, trying to destroy someone's covenant before the Lord. Be careful of that wicked heart. I don't know in whose heart. And, uh, <laughs> wickedness of the heart. So, but he's saying, we have, uh, we have 45 minutes left. He's saying, what God put together let no lawyer put asunder. Let no bishop put asunder. Mm-mm. Let no mother put asunder. Let no father put asunder. You're saying to me, what about somebody being uh, in an abusive relationship? Who, and somebody who's in... Uh, <clears throat> there are outliers that must be handled uh, what is it, individually. That must be handled individually. Those cases must be handled with great care to restore marriage, to restore, to restore the marriage. Of course, if your marriage is not built on the right foundation also, you can expect those things to happen. So the foundation must be rebuilt. If you see somebody is in an abusive marriage, that tells you the foundation is bad, faulty, must be built. The foundation must be rebuilt. So there's going to be a lot of work. You know, it's not easy when you have built a building, a tall building, 10-story building, by an architect who's greedy for gain, or an engineer who's greedy for gain. (laughs) So rather than going maybe 500 meters deep, he only goes 100 meter deep. Rather than using the right material for, 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 for absorbing the earthquake shocks in those earthquake prone zones, he only uses some flimsy materials that are only suitable for Namibia. <laughs> only suitable for Namibia. And you think such a building will stand to overcome? <laughs> you think such a married built on a flimsy foundation will overcome? I corner. <laughs> Never. Yeah. So when you find abuse and whatever have you, those complicated issues that, that trouble your heart, that, oh, what about this one? Oh, what about this one? Then the foundation is faulty. That means the foundation is faulty. It must be rebuilt. So when you have a tall building that is built on a shallow foundation, you know, the, the, the amount of work to go there and, uh, and fortify this building, you may even end up spending more money than you, than you spent initially. Hallelujah. So what I'm saying is the foundation has to be rebuilt. Hallelujah. So, but the words of the Lord are straight. They are clear. He's saying, let no man put asunder. Meaning, you and your marriage, your husband, your wife, your children, whoever is there. He says, when you have your marriage covenant like this, 
and it's going like a ship in the ocean. And the waves are coming and they're tossing and tossing and they're trying to topple it down, <laughs> trying to topple it, trying to capsize it. Saying you must fight to ensure that that marriage does not capsize. <laughs> Hallelujah. You see the responsibility there. You see the responsibility to you as the husband, as the wife. He says, when well, your marriage is there, standing like this, and then the waves are coming, beating, beating, beating thoroughly. Well, I don't know what the, the waves are. The child has died, health issues, financial difficulties, whatever. He say, when the waves are beating, 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 and doubt is coming now, say, you just leave this man. Leave this woman. Say, there is a responsibility on you that no man put us under. There's a responsibility on you to protect your marriage, to protect your covenant, to be true to the covenant, to be faithful to the Lord, to be faithful to your yes. When you said, yes, I do, the Lord says, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Now that you have said yes, you grab that and run with your yes. <laughs> he said, if you, if he says anything apart from that, when you say yes and then later you change your yes to no, he says, that is from the devil. <laughs> did you, did somebody get that? Let your yes be yes. Anything apart from that is from the evil one. Hallelujah. Let your yes be yes. Anything apart from that is from Satan. May walk or motor. Yeah, what do they say in Swahili? Matthew chapter 5, verse 37. Today is fire here. 537 here. <laughs> when you get your, when you are now here with your marriage covenant like this, your home, your husband is disturbing you. Yeah? <laughs> I don't know what he's disturbing you with, whether he's misusing the money or what. <laughs> I don't know what your husband is doing or your wife. But he says, when you said yes, all you need to, to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. When you say yes, and then later you say no, you say that's from the devil. Oh, that confusion is from Satan. <laughs> There's no part in the kingdom of God and in the house of the believers. Hallelujah. Your yes must be what? It must be yes. Therefore, of all the things that must succeed in your life as a believer, as a child of God, as a Christian, as a married couple, of all the things that must succeed, number one, he says, your marriage must succeed. Of all the things that must never, ever, ever fail, he says, your marriage must be one such. He says, if there is anything that must never fail, it must be your marriage. Must never fail. If, any, if anything is to never fail, it must be your marriage. If anything is to ever succeed, it must be your marriage. Therefore, if you are ever presented with a case like this, okay, like this. Your job or your marriage? <laughs> your job or your marriage? Your family or your marriage? <laughs> Look at that. Your children or your marriage? <laughs> As a Christian, you know what to do. You know the choice to make. You make it with tears in your eyes, eh? Tears in your eyes. Say, but you know what to do. Your marriage must succeed. Look, marriage is not an antithesis to, to, to church. Eh? It's not an antithesis to church. It's or antithesis to jobs, meaning marriage is not, it, it, 
the choice to, to, to be married, the marriage covenant is not either you are married or you have a job in the sense of, in the sense of if, you, if you are married, then you cannot have a job. No, that's not what we're saying. Not saying that if you are married, then you must not have a job. <laughs> or that you, if you are married, then you must abandon your entire family. <laughs> or that if you are married, then you don't go to church. No. You must see to it that your marriage succeeds. And marriage can only succeed in the Lord, isn't it? Can only succeed in the Lord. We have seen too many dramas on TV and in the news of the consequence, the consequence to the failure of leaving God out of your marriage covenant. Yeah. But I'm saying, if you have a boss out there, a boss somewhere that demands that you abandon your family over your job, then you must take a stand like this. And say, I refuse to give up my marriage, to sacrifice, to put up, say, to put up my marriage on the altar of sacrifice, <laughs> for, on, the sacri on the altar of sacrifice of convenience, so that I can succeed at job, so that I can be the director of the company. What good will it do to you? He says, what, what, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and be divorced? <laughs> or to gain the whole world and lose his family? To gain the whole world and lose favor with God? Even as a pastor, you do not put your marriage on the altar of convenience. You neglect your marriage and say, I am serving the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. And so my wife, what is this woman saying? Please, I don't want to listen to you. <laughs> yeah. I'm serving the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. And the children don't even know your face. <laughs> I'm serving the Lord. I'm serving the Lord. You come home so late. I'm serving the Lord. Be careful with that kind of serving the Lord where you don't honor your marriage because your marriage is your first church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Your marriage is your first church. The Apostle Paul said, if you cannot take care of your marriage, hey, then which church are you going or which church are you taking care of? <laughs> if you cannot take care of a marriage, if you are not faithful to your marriage, then which church are you taking care of? Whose church are you leading? <laughs> you're not fit to be a pastor he says but as a pastor then you must endeavor to ensure the success of your marriage that your marriage flourishes truly not a, not a facade not a facade at all mm -mm. It's, facade has nothing to do with success hallelujah so if anything must succeed it must be your marriage if anything must fail, mm -mm, not your marriage. I never. If it means losing your job so that you can be with your family, please, happily, <laughs> happily, happily choose your fa family over your job. Mm, it's more important, or more important. How long can you keep your job? If you choose your job over your family, how long can you keep it? Is there a guarantee that you'll keep it until you die? <laughs> no, not at all. Eh? You, you, you give up your marriage now, and then later on somebody overtakes you. And then the, the economic crisis comes, and then you are retrenched from work. And now you are at home with your empty house and the deafening silence and, and, and a mountain full of regrets. <laughs> Is it a mountain full of regrets? Hmm? And regrets running through your mind. The devil is, the devil is whispering this side. I told you, I told you so. You are worthless, and all these things. <laughs> so choose your marriage. Do the wise thing and choose your marriage. Hallelujah. I think I will, I will end there for now. So, as, uh, let me wrap up. Let me wrap up. Wrap up. Therefore, marriage covenant is not a matter of convenience. Therefore. Uh -huh. Marriage covenant is not a matter of convenience. It is not breakable. 
it must not be broken. It is not a contract. Marriage, the covenant and contract are two different things. They cannot be interposed. You cannot do this. Take a, a contract and then attach it to a covenant so that you can strengthen the covenant. Mm. The covenant is the strongest agreement ever. The strongest agreement ever. And, and, and it is binding until death. Binding until death. And it's stronger than a, co and a, a contract. The covenant is stronger than a contract. The contract has nothing, has nothing on, a, on a covenant. <laughs> yeah, Contracts have nothing on a covenant. And contracts, yes, they are temporary. Hmm? They are temporary. There is a consequence to breaking a contract. There is even more consequence to breaking a covenant. Mm -hmm. And the covenant is timeless. Timeless. I've made a covenant. Remember, Job says, I've made a covenant with my eyes, never to look upon a woman and lust after her. A covenant is timeless, does not expire. You have no loopholes. It's not for convenience, therefore, uh, it's not, we made a covenant for two days, or we make a covenant. But you see, the world has successfully convinced themselves that marriage is a covenant, is a contract. That's why they treat marriage as a contract. That's why they rely on the paper. They rely on the paper. No, this one is a tablet, not a paper. They rely on the paper to threaten each other. They like this, they have the letter. They have the letter. When they have the letter, then they feel secure. <laughs> when they have the letter, then they feel secure. When they have the letter, then they threaten each other. <laughs> with manipulation and all sorts. But covenant is not based on the letter. Covenant is binding to your soul, to your spirit. So whether there is a marriage certificate or not, the covenant still remains. You can take the marriage certificate, put it on fire. It does not annul, annul, annul. it does not annihilate. It does not destroy. It does not uh, nullify the marriage covenant. You can take the ring. The ring is, a, is merely a symbol. You can take the ring and throw it in the depths of the sea and close all the ring shops <laughs> and arrest all the ring makers. <laughs> Let somebody go and get another ring. But that getting rid of a ring and arresting all the ring makers <laughs> will not, does not, and cannot annul, annul, annul a covenant, a marriage covenant. Hallelujah. Does not annihilate marriage covenant. Amen. You can take anything. You, you, it doesn't matter because the covenant is binding to your spirit and your soul. And the covenant of marriage is such, the two are one. You see, that's, that is where the covenant is. Because now the two have been made one. It's not the two pens become one where you bring your car, I bring my car, and then we can share our cars. Therefore, based on our sharing of cars, then our, we, 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 we have a covenant. No. It's not based on the houses you have. <laughs> the covenant is not based on the money you have. The covenant is not based on the chocolates that you have. It's not based on the jobs that you have. It's not based on the computers and the telephones that you have. The covenant is based on your spirit and your soul. Like this. One flesh. Amen. That's why he says, shall I take the body of Christ and unite it with a prostitute? Yeah. Because that is the covenant. The two, the two, the two spirits, the two flesh, the two, the man and the woman. That's where the covenant is bounded on. That is made before God and God testifies to it. Amen. So it is not the 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 the, the marriage certificate uh, that uh, that upholds everything. Yeah, on this earth where you have lawyers and you have governments that want to see proof, 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 proof. Yeah, there it works. There it is important for those things. But before the Lord, 
um, whether it, whether it, whether the marriage certificate is lost in the fire or lost in the water or lost in the wind or lost wherever, mm, that does not annihilate anew the the covenant. Amen. Anybody with a question? I think uh, I wind it down there. Anybody with a question? Please bring your questions. Bring your questions and bring your discussion topics based on what we have discussed and based on anything else that was provoked in your spirit. Amen. Am I speaking to myself here? Pastor Sanil, can you hear me? Brother Chris, uh, Pastor Emily, and uh, Pastor... Yes, please. Yes. Hallelujah, yes. hallelujah. Powerful. Very good. Amen. Please, Amen. you are welcome. Let us discuss now. Thank you, Sanil. It's very powerful. Uh -huh. I've taken note of everything, <laughs> whatever yes. you're saying. Uh -huh. And um, the, the one thing was running in my mind because I have this instance uh, wherein, okay, husband and wife. Now, wife, for example, husband is caught up in sexual immorality. So as per the Bible says, or Jesus said that when husband or wife is caught in adultery, you can divorce that person, okay? Then wife divorces the husband because he was caught up in sexual immorality. Now the wife, can she marry another person or she has to remain single? And if she marries to another husband, to another man, then is she adulterous or how it is, how it goes? Because man is caught up in sexual immorality. And as for the words of Jesus, you can divorce the person because okay. of that. <clears throat> but if she marries, is she an adulterer? Or she has to wait for, I don't know. Can you please elaborate more? Yes. Now, when Jesus said, except for adultery, he was not saying, he was not giving the license to seek divorce. Let me get myself clear. Jesus was not pushing people to go for divorce. He was not giving people an encouragement to say, now use this and seek for a divorce. He was saying that except for adultery, then ABCD, then, uh, um, then they commit sexual immorality. So Jesus is saying uh, 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 that let me get it clear here. If you go to the book of Deuteronomy, I find only this one command. It says, if a man divorces his wife, marries somebody else, and then the woman also, I guess, suppose marries somebody else too, then you try to bring these people back together. That is abomination. You know, there was a campaign somewhere in, in, in Namibia. They were trying to destroy the, the new marriages. Yeah? You have divorcees who are married. They're trying now to, de to destroy the new marriage so that they can restore the, the previous marriages. <laughs> yeah. The Bible says that is abomination before the Lord. Wickedness before the Lord. But he does not say that the woman whose husband commits adultery or the man whose wife commits adultery must definitely divorce the wife or must definitely divorce the husband. You must seek reconciliation. If there is, if there is anything that you should do, that you should try to do, when your husband is caught up in, in, in immorality or your wife is caught up in immorality, the first thing that you should do your best to do is to save your marriage. Your first responsibility is not to go to the, to, to run to the doctor 
That's why I'm saying Jesus does not encourage running for divorce. He was just giving uh, uh, um, was that permission to say yes, except for uh, adultery. But he was not saying, therefore, don't, I mean, he was not saying that we should stop seeking resolution to our marriages, to our, to our, to our situations. Even if your husband is involved in immorality, they can still be restored. If a woman is involved in the immorality, she can still be restored. Look what happened to Hosea. The wife went back to a prostitution. What did the Lord say to Hosea? Go and get her back. <laughs> you see that? Go and get her back to show them how faithful I am a husband to them. And he demands the same faithfulness of you as a husband and wife too. When you're in that marriage, you're not seeking for ways out. You are seeking for ways to make your marriage work. That, is, that must be the, the, your mindset at all times. How can I make my marriage work? Not how can I destroy my marriage? Is it when my, my husband sins in this way so that then I can find a way to get another man? Because um, I'm really tired. He even snores as a matter of fact. No. What is required of you? Look, when Christ came, he came to buy back his wife. He came to win his wife. <laughs> the, the Lord says in Ezekiel, he says, oh, Israel, you are astounding <laughs> because for some prostitutes, they wait for a man to come and pay them. To come, pay them and sleep with them. Oh, but Israel, she goes and pays her, she goes prostitute herself and pays the men that she wants to sleep with. <laughs> her idolatry and adultery. And then he says, then he describes how, how he found her, how he loved her, how he saved her from a wretched state to bring her to himself. And now she has abandoned him. Was he say, stating his case? The reason why he must abandon her? No. He was lamenting over her unfaithfulness, her idolatry. You see, adultery is, equal, is equated to adultery. Adultery and idolatry are one. Because marriage represents uh, uh, the, the image of God. Therefore, if you uh, commit adultery, then you're committing idolatry. You're committing idol worship. You're, you're worshiping something else. Right? Therefore, when you speak about ad adultery and idolatry, you're speaking about the same thing. So, I, uh, so Israel delved into deep adultery, idolatry. The Lord said, no, I will not leave you there. I will come and save you. <laughs> I will come and take you and wash you with my blood and wash you with my water and renew you and give you a new heart and bring you back to myself. <laughs> I will go to a great strength to come and die for you. Yeah, he demands the same of a husband whose wife is unfaithful. He demands the same of a wife whose husband is unfaithful. Fight! Fight for that covenant. Exhaust your, all your strength. <laughs> Somebody's draining me. I'm tired. <laughs> I'm finished. I'm, I'm even having high blood pressure. <laughs> You say, fight, fight. Even if your wife is the one who's going to pay, for, uh, to, <laughs> he says, to go and pay us men to sleep with. He says, run after her and save your wife from, from, from trouble. Save your marriage. Yeah, that is a version of marriage the world does not present to us. Hmm? Where you fight to your head. You see, that's the covenant now. You, you keep it to your hurt. It's not convenience. 
So you fight, you find a way to restore your marriage. Your priority number one is not to seek divorce when your wife or husband is unfaithful. Mm. So, but now, hypothetically, yes, now speaking, it says, so now, should the wife seek for another husband if the husband is in, idol in, a, in adultery? Should the husband seek for another wife if the wife is in adultery? Fight, fight for your marriage. Now we live in a very disobedient nation, eh? a disobedient generation. I was watching a sad story on YouTube. The man married the woman. You see, this is why if you are not married to someone here, not yet married, make sure you're making the right choice before you get in. Hallelujah. He says, he marries this woman. And uh, he won her. It's like, uh, this is now my rendition. It almost felt like a competition, you see, she was a girl that, you know, was highly sought after. The men were jumping over each other to get her. And then he wins her. But they didn't really know each other. Yeah. And then they ended up in this relationship. And then they got married. I don't know how long they took before their marriage. A few weeks into their marriage, or is it months? It was a lifeless marriage. The marriage was lifeless. The husband was, um, the wife began to find excuse to spend, to spend time away from home. Began to find excuse to not be at home with the husband. She was bored with her husband. The infatuation wore over. You see, they, they went in with infatuation. They went into their marriage running on infatuation, on a fuel tank of infatuation. And you know, this one, it burns out very quickly. Oh, infatuation. Break, it was, burns out in the next one year, whatever, two years. And now for her, the, the infatuation tank burnt out. And the man found out that the woman was cheating with her. I think it was her boss. And he tried to persuade her. She refused, totally refused. And she moved out of the house. Of course, you cannot force anybody to stay with you. <laughs> Unless they call police on you. <laughs> she left and he was left miserable in his house. Very young man in his twenties. Marriage within the first year, uh, I mean, divorce within the first year of their marriage. Very terrible situation, I know. And now when you're so young like that and your passions are still burning, <laughs> should you wait until you are 50 before <laughs> to wait for your wife to die? These are, <clears throat> these are sensitive matters indeed. But what is most important here is this. I'm talking to you now. I'm not talking to that brother. I'm now talking to you. You that are listening to me. That if you are married, then fight for your marriage while, it is while, you, while you have the chance to invest in your marriage and make sure that it succeeds. So that we don't delve into hypotheticals and then walk away confusing ourselves <laughs> with, with endless questions of what if, what if, what if. Yeah, But now it comes back to us. Here you are, preparing for marriage. Then how do you make sure, or should I say, then you make sure, make, make dead sure that your marriage will stand, that you build the right foundation for your marriage. Yes, that you build it, and you build it so well. Because if you are careless in how you build your foundation, and then you find yourself being the statistic of, of those hypotheses that are so complicated, you can't answer in one session. <laughs> we don't want to, be, to end up being the practical uh, textbook case of a hypothesis. 
<laughs> we want we want to avoid textbook hypothesis so that our lives, our marriages, they give testimony to the words of the Lord. That yes, it is true. The covenant of the Lord is possible today. That yes, it is true. Genesis chapter one is still possible. Yes, it is true. Genesis chapter two is still possible. We don't want to fix our eyes on divorce and then dis disturb ourselves. Now you're having sleepless night because of, of a question on how to handle divorce if it comes. No, 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 no. Don't let those ones disturb you. What must disturb you now is this. My marriage must succeed. Yeah, let that disturb you more so that you, will, you, you, so that you will never find yourself on the other side. Now, on the other side, there are so many questions. We cannot finish them. Yeah, <laughs> so many complicated questions and complicated issues and, you know, and I, and I may not even give you satisfactory answers. But what is sure is this. When you, when you focus making your marriage a success, then you will not find yourself in that hypothesis. Hallelujah. But it's a good question though that you asked. Thank you so much. Dio. Who else? Amen. Who else? Thank um, you. Amen, you're welcome. And one last question. <laughs> yes. I don't know if somebody has some question I can ask later. Give them chance also. Uh, I, I, I don't know if people are afraid of asking questions. I don't know. Uh, just go ahead. <laughs> okay. So now, Fine. in this case, uh -huh. because why I'm asking, it's, it's, uh -huh. it's prevalent in my circles, uh -huh. in my family members, in my relatives. Uh -huh. Now, uh, there is a witch doctor. He does whatever, spells, mantra, on a woman mm -hmm. and he marries that woman okay mm -hmm. and now this woman is unbeliever and now comes the point wherein the wife's eyes is suddenly open okay so and she starts believing in god and she thinks that whatever happened it was wrong but this covenant the marriage covenant that took place between them was not in the presence of God. It was through some faulty, evil idols, principles or whatever. So that's the first question. Does God sees this covenant or this pledge as a marriage institution or like they are married or not? And secondly, what she must do in such cases when the husband is still in those heavy witchcraft is like he's excelling in those things so you are saying so does god a witch mm -hmm. doctor plays witchcraft on a woman mm -hmm. yeah plays witchcraft on a woman and then takes her for her for his wife mm -hmm. manipulates her and then takes him her for his wife so is that marriage before the Lord? That's the question. Yeah. The answer is no, that's not marriage. Hmm. In um it's 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 uh you also find places where they have what they call traditional marriages. Hmm. Somebody goes there and takes a woman, brings him home, brings her home, and then tells the elders those also ones that believe in witchcraft, <laughs> that this one is now my wife. And then they start living like that. That's not marriage. That is immorality. So yes. she has, she has, when she comes to light, this woman comes to Jesus. Now she has mm -hmm. full rights. Yeah. Because in terms of the mm -hmm. world, she has signed the agreement and everything. Mm -hmm. Now she has to divorce, right? Mm -hmm. She has to, she must divorce. Mm -hmm. So that's what I was thinking. Is it valid before the Lord? No, it's if not. it is not, then I think that divorce doesn't make sense also. So you can divorce. She's and not, but 
there is that, um, so the marriage does not stand before God, but there is this agreement, this, this weak, wicked agreement. It's like somebody who's, it's like somebody who's sold themselves, their souls to the devil. When they come to Christ, they have to die to self. They have to annul. They have to destroy all the other agreements with Satan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of musicians and wit and what, and artists, uh, musicians and um, what's the word? Actors, yes, and pastors who have agreements with Satan to give them power and wealth and fame. Yeah. So there is there is an agreement. But it's a wicked agreement before the Lord. So that's so the not, Lord does not recognize that. Yeah. Before it's, the it's zero before the Lord. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank Amen. you. Andrew. Amen. Uh, you're welcome. One question that I. Um, steps. Uh, Brother Christian, before you go, just, just mention your question again, and then we finish with that. Oh, okay, thank you, Lord Bishop. Uh -huh. uh, I just have to quickly uh, go get someone. So yes. My question was that um, what, what are the steps married to be true or right before God? Because mm -hmm. you find some people, they might be lived together, mm -hmm. and then in a way that they consider that they are married, that in the way they are married for the case. So what are the three for so one that no truly are this person not before the law but before God also? So mm -hmm. what must they go through? They must go do this and this must be done and this for the case to be said that this is free a true marriage and not for co together claiming that they are yes the which Covenant, marriage covenant is acceptable before the Lord. It is a marriage covenant that adheres to the word of God, that is, that is founded on God, on God's word. Hallelujah. Now, this is a very deep topic. We can't finish today. <laughs> yeah. If I go deeper uh, to try and explain nuances there, we'll not finish. But that's why one of the, one of the times the mighty prophets of the Lord were on air and they were saying, that for those that are in some of these marriages, they either come to church, I mean, they are, not, they are now born again, they either come to church now, and then ask, <clears throat> and then now, what, what's the word, sanctify their union before the Lord, yeah, so that it will be legit, legit, yeah, otherwise they are in immorality. Yes, so I'll just leave it there for now. So, but what are the things? Come to the Lord. Come to the Lord and surrender everything to the Lord. Marriage is designed to mirror the image of God, period. It's for the glory of God only, nothing else, nothing else. So, yeah, so I think we end it there. And um, uh, in absentia of any further um, questions, I think we have um, covered a lot. Maybe next time we can go deeper into this question. Thank you so much. It is an important question. It is an important question, <clears throat> but time will not allow us now. All right. Um, we have two minutes. Does anybody want to say something in these two minutes? <laughs> okay. Mm, yes, that's First Timothy chapter three, verse four to five says he must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him and he must do so in a manner worthy of full respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Very true. Great. So thank you so much, everybody, for your participation, for your tuning in. This our, our fellowship has come to an end. Um, we have a, a group on WhatsApp. So if you'd like to be added to the group, you're welcome. We have, um, we have a, a, a Telegram group and we have a YouTube channel where we'll be putting the videos. So you're most welcome. 
to watch and follow. Amen. So let me ask Brother Sanil to pray for us. Thank you very much, Senior Bishop. Mm. And we learned a lot. So kindly share the notes with us so that we can go through it again. <laughs> Amen. Yes. So let us pray. Mm. Mighty Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we come before you. Father, we bring our repentance, our shortcomings, and negligence, arrogance in terms of our marriage, marriage between you and us, Father, and even our earthly marriage. Father, please forgive us and cleanse us and let the blood of Jesus Christ establish a solid relationship, a solid covenant, a purifying covenant in our life. Bring clarity, bring stability in our marriage. Let the pillar of our marriage stand strong with the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. And I pray that all those who are going to get married, that you would enlighten our heart to see the reality of the covenant, marriage covenant, which you instituted in the beginning. And let every evil voice of the enemy, every evil deception of the enemy, I speak the blood of Jesus Christ against those voices, Father. Let your will be done and let your kingdom come, Father, in us, in our family members. And we commit into your will every tree which my heavenly father has not planted. Let it be uprooted in the name of Jesus from our life. We surrender everything unto you because you are our father. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you. Thank you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. By a donkey. Powerful, powerful. Oh, bless you all, blessed people. Amen. Thank you so much, blessed senior bishop, for coming to us. Amen. It was such a blessing for your unceasing love and support. You are May the Lord welcome. increase you, please. Amen. Thank you. Shalom, shalom. The Lord bless you tremendously, brother Chris. Amen. After so many invitations, I'm also really grateful. <laughs> That's really a blessing. Thank you. Uh, really, I hope I'll meet them for the next one. Because really, there's really a few victims here. Amen. Um, thank you. You are welcome. <clears throat> thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you over there in, uh, in Ovenduka. Over there, you know, Maruru, the Lord bless you. Over there, you know, Shitenda. Amen. Saudi Arabia. Amen. Shalom. Amen. Thank you so much. Amen. Amen. Shalom, everyone. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. shalom. Amen. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom. Shalom, shalom, Kevin. <laughs> Okay. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 Amen.